So today we're starting to talk about, again, about dominance and recessiveness. We've already talked in class about how you can cross individuals together to figure out which allele is dominant. Across two pure breeding strains, the F1 phenotype tells you which allele is dominant. And a lot of you were asking me at that point during office hours outside of the classroom and so forth, well, how do you know in advance, can you predict which allele is going to be dominant? So today we start looking at if there's anything we can determine in advance that tells us why would one allele of a gene be dominant, can we explain it at the molecular level? What's going on? What is dominance? So two pretty straightforward goals today. One is to do exactly that, to explain why some alleles are recessive and some are dominant. And the other is to start having the class think more beyond just a Punnett square, not just about having one mom and one dad having a number of offspring, but rather thinking about multiple crosses happening at the same time, what's happening in the population or in the entire species, not just a single cross. There are lots of different ways that scientists have categorized mutations and alleles. These are the major two, gain of function, loss of function. They're very aptly named. If a mutation causes a protein to gain a new job, it does something new in the cell it's never done before, that's a gain of function mutation. Those tend to, although not always, be dominant. Loss of function happens when a mutation in the DNA creates a version of a protein that, what? Loss of function. So the protein no longer does what it used to do because of this mutation. Those tend to be recessive. There are various flavors of loss of function mutation. Some of them decrease the amount of an activity a protein might have. Some of them eliminate it altogether. That's the null mutation. Protein has zero activity left when it sustains that, when the gene that encodes that protein sustains that mutation. So that's the important terminology for the chapter. And it's usually, it's a good assumption usually that gain of function is dominant, loss of function is recessive. Any questions? Hmm. Interesting conclusions on the quiz so far. So we're going to look at one example of each of a dominant gain of function and a recessive or a loss of function mutation today. We've already talked a little bit about Huntington's disease. Do you remember when? How does Huntington's disease, disease come about? What's the mutation? It's a, it's a microsatellite that expands, so a CAG, like up here. And you've got a small number, this gene normally has a small number of these trinucleotides, CAG, over and over again in a row in the gene. But some individuals have many more copies of that repeat, and it's that bigger protein that's encoded by the longer gene that causes problems in cells and ultimately leads to getting Huntington's disease. If this is gain of function, is this going to be dominant or recessive? We expect it to be, we would predict that it would be dominant. Gain of function goes with dominant, loss of function usually is recessive. So we're going to look now a little bit at the molecular level. Why is this gain of function mutation dominant? So right here is the amino acid sequence of part of the Huntington protein. We've got histidine, serine, glutamine, valine, isoleucine, methionine, leucine. The protein stretches on in both directions. This is just one little part of the protein. And the CAG, you can see here, encodes the amino acid glutamine, Q, in shorthand, if you want to do one-letter codes. GLN, if you're talking about the three-letter amino acid codes here. So what happens if you've got a trinucleotide repeat expanded version of the Huntington's protein? What's that part of the protein going to look like? 
CAG, CAG, CAG yeah. 20 times, it's going to have a lot of glutamines in a row. It's going to be glute protein will have the sequence glutamine, 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 glutamine all in a stretch. Yep. And that's because, as we'll learn later, although I'm sure most of you already know, when messenger RNAs are translated into proteins, you read three nucleotides at a time. And that's why the trinucleotide repeat expansion class of mutations is particularly interesting to geneticists, because when you repeat a nucleotide three times, back to back to back to back, it means it's going to be the same amino acid encoded back to back to back to back in a protein. So in this case, it turns out to be bad to have a lot of glutamines in a row in a protein. And biochemists, I'm not a biochemist anymore, I used to be, colloquially refer to glutamines as being kind of sticky amino acids. When you have a lot of glutamines in a row, like is sort of diagrammed here in the protein, when you have that long string in a polyglutamine expanded allele of the Huntington gene, all those glutamines tangle together. So here we've got one Huntington protein that black coil being just that stretch of glutamines. When it's in a cell with a bunch of other Huntington proteins that are made from the same allele of the Huntington gene, all of those glutamines tangle together. The glutamine tracts from multiple versions of the protein all clump together. And eventually those form amyloid fibrils, which are characteristic of a lot of neurodegenerative disorders. Alzheimer's, Huntington's, and a bunch of others. And somehow, these huge aggregates of proteins in the cells cause the cells to dysfunction. In this case, causes neurons to die. You have these huge tangles of proteins. You can imagine, imagine with me. Close your eyes. You can imagine what sort of bad things happen when proteins are tangling up your cytosol, the cytoplasm. Maybe it disrupts membrane trafficking or cytoskeletal trafficking. So cargo trying to be shipped along microtubules inside the cell. Maybe it can't get to where it's trying to go because there are these huge aggregates of these proteins blocking intracellular trafficking. Maybe. It's one hypothesis. So that's why the extra glutamines are bad. This is not normal for the Huntington protein. To have huge lengths of just glutamine, they do this inside the cell. Questions or concerns? So why is this dominant? That's what we're here for. This is case one. Huntington's disease, we're talking about why is polyglutamine expanded, trinucleotide repeat expanded, Huntington dominant? Why isn't it recessive? Look at what happens when you're a heterozygote. Right? Because it's always the heterozygote where you can tell which allele is dominant. Is a heterozygote normal or is a heterozygote going to get Huntington's disease, right? In this case, as, we t as I've already mentioned, this allele, the expanded allele, is dominant. So in a heterozygote, let's say that here, circled in red, we've got one allele, a heterozygote, two copies were diploids. So we've got the red allele and we've got the blue allele, two different versions of the same chromosome. So the red allele has the original DNA for an amino acid sequence. It's got one glutamine shown here. CAG, just one copy. Turns out the Huntington protein's normal job is it's a transcription factor. It goes into the nucleus and regulates whether or not certain genes are turned on or turned off. That's its normal function. So the normal version of Huntington, the red allele in, in a heterozygote, still does that. It goes into the nucleus, does its normal job. We'll get into details about transcription later in the term. What does the blue allele do? That's got this expansion. Now it's got, in this case, two CAGs. Imagine it's got 20 or 40 or 60 or 80. What does it do? It produces a protein. It's got a lot of glutamines. What happens to the cell? Good things or bad things? Bad things. So it's dominant. 
this has gained a function. No longer does the blue allele, the polyglutamine expanded version, go into the nucleus. It, before it gets there, it tangles up with a bunch of other copies of the Huntington protein and causes the cells to die. So it's actually not really surprising that it's dominant. We never, we're never able, to, never able to see what the red allele, the normal allele, is doing in the nucleus regulating gene activity because the, the non-wild type, the mutant allele, kills the cell, and we observe that. It's a dominant effect. In other words, having one good copy, this is where dominance versus recessiveness, maybe this is oversimplifying things, having one good copy of the gene doesn't save you from the bad version that's run amok inside your cell. The gain of function has, is doing something that's obvious. Dr. Yep. Why, why would we say it's a gain of function if it's a bad function that it gains? But it's still gained it, right? So it's doing something, so the gain of function, another way you could describe it is it's doing something new that we've never seen before. Not necessarily a new good thing, but it's doing something that the wild type or normal version doesn't do. Why, why would you say, like, we lost the good uh, function of that gene? You can say that if you want. But that sounds more confusing, because now, yeah, now we have to determine, does the blue version also occasionally get into the nucleus to regulate gene transcription, or does it always get stuck in the cytoplasm in these protein inclusions? So what would you classify as a loss of function? I did not pay him to say that, but let's talk about a loss of function example. I'm not just saying Angel Angelina Jolie is a loss of function example. <laughs> One of her genes, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm serious when I mean I'm not trying to make light of breast cancer or ovarian cancer, but I use this as a good example because there's a lot of mis misconceptions in the public, among you as well, about some of these topics. So this is really important to discuss. And this is a case of a recessive mutation that causes loss of function. Okay, so many of you might be aware this happened a couple of years ago, I suppose, that at some point Angelina Jolie had genetic testing, as is available now for most women and men too. She discovered that she had a, an allele of a breast cancer gene that predisposes her to getting breast and ovarian cancer. And so she chose to have a prophylactic mastectomy, so she had her breasts removed in advance of the possibility of getting cancer, and I think she had an ovarectomy too, if I'm not mistaken, had her ovaries removed or she did that subsequently. So pretty serious stuff just based on genetic testing. So she found out she has an allele of this gene that might someday possibly, right, these are not 100% risks. So there's a possibility, a significant possibility that she would develop breast or ovarian cancer and in her family. So now it's time for one more Socrative quiz. So we, I have to close the first one first, so hang on just a second. If you do either one of the two today, I'll give you attendance points. So if you missed the first one already, that's fine. Yeah, relax. Hang out for a second. OK. Ready? Go for it. So I just want to, I would want to get your opinions on these three questions. It's exactly the same thing that you'll see on the quiz. So these are questions that we're going to address today about this loss of function mutation in the breast cancer gene. So we'll see what happens. So here's the breast cancer 1 gene. I prefer, although I can't force you to, but I prefer to call this, and I prefer you to call this the breast cancer susceptibility gene for a specific reason that we'll talk about in a second. So this gene, where is it found? Let's see, what chromosome is this in the picture? Chromosome 17. So this is human chromosome 17. Right there, that little red line on the long arm of human chromosome 17 is where this gene lives. 
So if the breast cancer gene is on chromosome 17, how many of us have it? Do I have it? Yeah. Which of my cells have this gene? All of them, right? Every single chromosome, every single cell in all of us has this gene. BRCA1 is the name of the gene. So we've all got two copies of this gene. One on the chromosome we got from our mom, one we got from our dad. And there are mutations in this gene that cause problems. Right, so here's the loss of function coming. The normal breast cancer 1 protein that's produced by the breast cancer 1 gene is huge. Hundreds of amino acids. Here, I'm just showing you both in black and in gray, the first 262. This is a really big protein that's produced from this gene. First 262 amino acids on the screen. There's one single, bless you, there's one single point mutation, so a G instead of a T, at one spot on the chromosome. One nucleotide, there's a G instead of a T. That causes the breast cancer protein that's produced to be just the amino acids that are shown here in black. So you get the first 75 amino acids of the protein, and that's it. Then translation stops. You just get this short little tiny piece of the BRCA1 protein. It turns out this is bad. We want the whole protein. So the whole protein, BRCA1, does something good for us normally. It's when we've lost it that bad things happen to us. So there's loss of function. So this protein, when you only have the first tiny little bit of the protein produced, doesn't do what it normally does. It's lost its normal function. Backdrop? Yeah. How do we know it's lost, it hasn't lost its normal function because of another allele that produces a, a negative protein which counteracts that? Like in the first example. So you look in people, you look in an individual that's homozygous for that allele, they're fine. So you're a hypothetical allele. They're fine. So we know it's not that sort of an issue. And most of us have two wild-type copies of the BRCA1 gene. We don't have to worry about possibly developing breast cancer someday. But some of us do carry one of the mutant alleles. So here's what the BRCA1 protein normally does. The full-length version up there on top, the wild-type, the one that most of us have, the allele that most of us have, the role of the BRCA1 protein is actually in DNA repair. The BRCA1 protein goes around our genomes looking for damage and tells the cell, hey, you need to repair this damage, otherwise this is going to be a mutation that gets passed on to daughter cells, and that would be bad. So BRCA1, the breast cancer protein, actually protects our cells from mutations. So what happens if you have the mutant version? This short little chunk of the BRCA1 protein, does it do the same job? It doesn't. It's lost that protection of surveilling our genome against damage. So what happens to our DNA? If BRCA1 is not there to help fix the problem, the mutations that normally happen to our DNA over time, what's going to happen to our DNA? We accumulate, yeah, we accumulate mutations in our DNA. Then what happens? Then you develop cancer. So the BRCA1 protein protects us from cancer unless we have the version of the BRCA1 protein that can't because of that one mutation that T to G mutation I talked about on the last slide, right? You have that one mutation, make a short protein, not the full-size protein. The short protein can't protect our cells. Then you have a higher likelihood of developing breast cancer. So in this case, BRCA1 lost its normal function. Why is it recessive to have this bad allele? 
the shortened, the, the allele that produces the shortened version of the protein. So imagine you're a heterozygote. You've got one normal version, one mutant version. What's happening in the cell? Sure. So in this case, you've got one wild type copy, one mutant copy. You're a heterozygote. So your one normal copy produces the normal BRCA1 protein that does its normal job of surveilling your DNA against damage. And the other version, the mutant version, just doesn't do anything. So that mutation is recessive. What happens if you have both versions? What if you're homozygous for the deletion, or the point mutation that causes the shortened BRCA1 protein? Then you have no copies of the wild type version. You have no protein that's surveilling your genome against damage. Then you have the susceptibility for breast cancer, increased susceptibility for breast cancer. As far as anybody knows, nobody starts life having homozygosity for this mutation. You can look at other animals that have mutations like this, and it's embryonic lethal. So if you are homozygous, you don't have any copies of the BRCA1 protein at all. You don't even develop to term. Embryonic lethal. So everybody that's in this room, I guarantee you nobody here has two mutations in their BRCA1 gene. You wouldn't be here. So each of us can either be heterozygous for a mutation or homozygous for the wild type allele. So why is it breast cancer susceptibility? I kind of bristle about the idea of the breast cancer gene, which is how I phrased it in the quiz. Speaking of which, let's see how things are going here. Pretty good. Some of you thought that I don't have the breast cancer gene, but I do. But we all do, right? I don't necessarily have the bad allele of the gene, but we all have the breast cancer gene. Dr. Ross? Yep. You said that um, to be able to get a breast cancer here, you would need to have both of them. And since you say if you have both of them, you end up dying, that means that environmental factors cause a good allele to go bad? Right, so if, if, if each of us starts life as either a heterozygote or homozygous for the wild type version, how do you get breast cancer? This is where I'm really serious. I'm not, I, you know, I like to try to inject some humor. I don't know if it's always successful. This is not a humorous topic, but this is, I think, a really useful analogy for having two copies of an allele, two copies of a gene. Why is it useful? So if you're born like this, You've got two wild type versions of a gene. That's good. What does it look like if you've got heterozygosity for a loss of function mutation? You've got one useless copy of the gene. You're still okay because you've got one role left. What's the situation like when you've got breast cancer in this analogy? Somewhere later in life, you get a mutation in the second, the only good remaining version of the gene. You get a random mutation in that gene. So it's not that you're born with two mutations. People that just have, that are heterozygous, that have one bad copy and one good copy, start life with only one good copy. The probability of that one good version of the allele that they were born with getting damaged at some point during life by environmental factors or other factors, just like random mutations during cell division while you're developing, at some point you lose, by mutation, the second good copy of BRCA1, then you're in that situation where you have no copies of the BRCA1 protein doing its normal job. Question. Yeah. So Sure, so this is why hopefully some of you might be interested in genetic counseling. I certainly am, but I'm, I can't get into it. This is my passion. But right, it's really difficult to be a genetic counselor because there are so many factors you have to take into account. Starting next class, yeah, 
we're going to start talking about polygenic traits, where one trait like susceptibility to cancer is caused by multiple genes. There's not just one gene. If you've got the bad version, you get cancer. If you've got the good version, you don't. That makes it easy to do genetic counseling. That's brachydactyly, for example. So we'll talk about that by the end of class. But in this case, right, environment plays a factor. There are other genes that are also in important in whether or not you eventually develop breast or ovarian cancer. So like similar genes that code for proteins that um, make mutations? Or other genes that, are also, that work with the BRCA1 protein in the DNA damage response. You might need multiple mutations in multiple genes to get a higher chance of developing breast cancer. So the reason that this is susceptibility to breast cancer is because if you've got one mutant version when you're born, you've got one wild type version, one mutant version, that just means you're more likely to, because you only start with one good copy, by chance, randomly, due to mutation, you're more likely to develop a mutation in your one remaining good copy of the gene, that would lead to a much higher probability of breast cancer. Other questions? No. I'll leave much of it for Dr. Bush if you ever want to take his cancer biology class, since he's the cancer biologist. Uh, no. If we have like the two good versions and we're like homozygous for the good version of the protein, yep. and then the, this protein is the one that fixes mutations, mm -hmm. it, it, it means we could still get breast cancer, it's just very, very slight. We have two shots. Basically. Right. So if you start out life homozygous for the wild type versions, it's much, 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 much less likely that you happen to randomly during your lifetime in the same cell get mutations in both copies of your breast cancer 1 gene. Okay. Oh, that was that slide. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of off topic a little bit, but does this be our... I'm the king of off topic. Cool. Does the BRCA gene cause other cancers when it's mutated, or just breast cancer? And then there's other genes that play into the So the specificity of the cancer, that's an interesting question that I'm not an expert in by any means. But it, it is reasonable to assume that because this is a gene that has a function in repairing DNA in every cell in our body, that there's some other reason why breast cancer, the breast tissue is more likely to develop cancer as a result of these sorts of mutations than others. And I'm not sure what those are. No, we can do it. That's a really astute question. So you could imagine that, that having skin cells that don't have the BRCA1 protein would lead to also an increased probability of getting skin cancer. Okay. So I think we've touched on all these. Breast cancer gene is only found in breast tissue? No. Found in every cell, even my toe cells. If you have the breast cancer gene, will you get breast cancer? No. No, because if we've all got the breast cancer it's gene, it's doing good things for us normally unless we have the mutation. I've got the gene. There we have it. wants to hear about peas? Bye. So one more example of dominance. And this is, I'm just using this example. It's quick, but it's, I think, also il useful to illustrate how dominance works at the molecular level or inside the cell. So we've looked at a couple of P traits before. Here I'm just talking about color because it's a really, I think, simple to understand example. One of the traits Mendel worked with was P flower color. You get purple flowers, you get white flowers. Purple is dominant to white, he discovered. Three to one ratio when you cross pure breeding parents and self the F1s. Why is purple dominant to white? Well, it's all about pigmentation. So there's a pigment precursor that's present in the white flowers. It doesn't, it's a precursor. It doesn't cause color development in the white flowers. What has to be present to turn it into anthocyanin, which is a purple pigment that causes the purple flowers? There's a chemical reaction that happens inside a cell, which means we need an enzyme. 
or a protein. An enzyme is a type of protein, yep. So there's an enzyme that turns the colorless white pigment into the purple pigment. So why is purple dominant to white? So let's say this is, let's say we've got two alleles, color, white, CW, and color, purple, CP. So if you're CP over CP, homozygous for the dominant version, you produce this enzyme that converts the dye, the precursor to purple, you get purple flowers. What happens when you're white over white? Let's, let's imagine the CW allele is a loss of function mutation, makes that enzyme no longer able to convert the precursor to purple pigment. So if you don't make any of the functional enzyme that converts substrate to purple, what color is the flower? It's going to be white. So if you've got the two versions of the purple allele, you're purple. You've got two versions of the white allele that doesn't make a functional enzyme, you're white. What's the critical question? Pardon? What did you say? What's in, what have we not talked about yet? What's, what's the heterozygote? How does the heterozygote cell function? What happens inside the cell? What does the CW allele produce? A broken enzyme that doesn't do this conversion. The CP allele <coughs> produces enzyme that converts white to the precursor to anthocyanin. So that's why purple is dominant to white. Even if you've got one copy of the protein working, it's still converting pigment into precursor pigment into the purple pigment, anthocyanin. It's dominant. I'm not going to go through the green to yellow, the bottom example, specifically because it's exactly the same story. Different enzymes, different genes, but it's the exact same story. You start out with yellow precursor pigment. You need an enzyme to convert it to chlorophyll to make green peas, green pea pods, green anything in plants, really. So the ability to produce that green pigment is dominant. If you've got one or both versions of the allele that produce chlorophyll, you make green peas, green pea pods, green stems, green stalks. Those two. Right, so you do need to know something about what the gene or protein normally does to know when there's a change, if it's a gain of function or if it's a loss of a function. Yeah. So you do have to have some background information there. You can't know from no information at all. You can't predict is it a gain of function or is it a loss of function. There are some tricks there that we'll learn later in the term, sometimes when it's more likely a loss of function, like in the breast cancer protein. When you have a mutation that makes your protein much, much shorter than it normally is, it's usually a good bet to assume that the protein as a whole does not do the job that it normally did, where there's like a tenth of the protein produced. So it's a couple of looks. We've got Huntington's disease, breast cancer, flower pigmentation, a few different examples of dominance and recessiveness, more at the cellular and molecular level how two versions of a gene can interact with each other and do the normal thing or cause a mutant phenotype. Speaking of which, let me check the results of our original survey today. So let's see. What was the subject of the movie? Most of you, so some of you admitted that you didn't watch the video, others guessed. It wasn't bacteria. It wasn't brachydactyly. So do watch it for next class. So I wanted you to watch that for this class because in the movie they talked about dominance. And we were talking about dominance today. This movie is also relevant, as you saw, for those of you that watched it, to what we're talking about next class, which is quantitative traits, or as we discussed just a minute ago, when multiple genes all contribute to one phenotype. So it's a good introduction to that concept for next class as well. So if you didn't watch it yet, please do. Now, about the rest of the questions. 
a loss of function mutation is usually dominant. Three quarters of the class got it right. So we said a loss of function mutation is normally recessive. Okay. 91% of the class got the second question right. Brachydactyly is caused by a mutant allele. So 91% of you said it's mutant or it's wild type? Mutant. Yes, thank you. Why do we know that? So we looked at the picture, not this picture, the picture of the x-rays of brachydactylus people. How do you know that's mutant? What evidence do you have? Why did you come to that conclusion? Because most people don't have it, right? We've talked already in class about how you know what's mutant, what's wild type. You look around, whatever is normal, whatever we see most people having is wild type. So brachydactyly is caused by a mutation. Looks like wild type in here is dark skin, dark hair color rather, so I'm mutant. Now, the third question, I, I'm not surprised at this point, I'm mutant in many, many ways, not just that. Up to this point, I'm not surprised at all about the responses from the class. This is typical. So you get the first one right, you get the second one right. 43% of the class gets the third question right. Brachydactyly is caused by a recessive allele, not a dominant allele. So is, is short fingers dominant or recessive? Well, I'm, I'm not asking you now because half of you are going to say one thing and half the other. So that's what we're here to talk about for the rest of the class, next 10 minutes. Right, one more case of dominance. And this is to prove a really important, really important point. That's a common misconception in genetics. So this all started about, and the reason I'm using brachydactyly is not because, I don't know, this is why. I'm not going to make anything up. This is why. A paper in Science in 1908. Wow. So more than a century ago. This is, by the way, this is kind of like genetic smackdown. This is how they did smackdowns a century ago. In writing, in scientific journals. But if you read this, you can kind of imagine like these hoity-toity guy, old guys in Victorian, no, post-Victorian England. To the editor of Science. I am reluctant to intrude in a discussion concerning matters of which I have no expert knowledge. And I should have expected the very simple point which I wish to make to be familiar to biologists. So this is a non-biologist writing about biology. So he's saying, I don't know anything about this, but you guys should have figured this out already. Mr. Ewell, look lower down in the second paragraph, Mr. Ewell is reported to have suggested, as a criticism of Mendel, that if brachydactyly is dominant, which it is, Short fingers is dominant, not recessive. If brachydactyly is dominant, in the course of time, one would expect to get three brachydactylous persons to one normal. So Mr. Udney Ewell, not the person that's writing this, but the person who wrote the letter that this person's responding to, had said, hey, wait a second, if brachydactyly is dominant, shouldn't we have 75% of the population with short fingers? Then he concludes, in a word, there is not, well, this is not the conclusion, it's just the next part of the letter. In a word, there's not the slightest foundation for the idea that a dominant character should show a tendency to spread. <coughs> that is to increase in frequency to go through the population for everybody to have brachydactyly. Okay. So what Mr. Udney Yule, I think, was thinking about was this Punnett square. So he was imagining where did he get that three to one number? Why 75% of the population? So he's talking about two people that are heterozygous for this allele mating. So big B causes brachydactyly, and the little b is wild type. So if you do a typical monohybrid cross, 75% right, of the offspring should be brachydactylus because they have, it's dominant. So you've got three individuals that have at least one big B, so 75% of the kids from this cross should be short feeder, short toed.
Where's the fallacy here? We know, look around the room, we know that brachydactyly is not present in 75% of the population. So where does the logic break down? What's different about this and this room? You have like other different crosses between like homozygous or non-brachydactyly and people that do have it, or heterozygous and non-brachydactyly. Right, so we're starting to think about genetics in the whole population of humans, not just in one cross. So yes, absolutely, if in one family. So what would, what does the wedding look like? I feel a little bit more free to be a little bit more gesturally here. So you've got husband marries wife. What are their phenotypes? They're both brachydactylous. Okay, so in that case that's drawn up here, yeah, three-quarters of their kids will also have brachydactyly. That's what Mendel would have predicted. What's the probability that in humanity as a whole, this cross happens? What do you think? Be honest. Pardon? Yeah, I mean, it's, who knows? A good guess, one in 100,000, maybe. It turns out that brachydactyly, as you might expect, is really rare. It's present in something like 1% or 2% of the population. So one in every 100 people, one in every 1,000 people, somewhere in that range, actually has this allele, the dominant allele, of brachydactyly. So what's more likely is not two heterozygotes having a family, and that that's happening in every cross in humanity. These are more likely. You've got one brachydactylous person that meets and falls in love with a non-brachydactylous person because the brachydactylous ones are really rare. One in a hundred to one in a thousand humans. So there's a really, really low chance that two people with brachydactyly are going to have kids. Or, on the right side there, 99% of the population is non-brachydactylous and we're meeting each other, falling in love, having kids, producing the overwhelming number of non brachydactylous people. So perhaps the most accurate version to show you what the population as a whole look like, looks like is this. That we have the case where one, that rare brachydactylous individual meets a non brachydactylous person and they have kids. How many of their kids have brachydactyly? What percentage? What fraction of their kids? 50%. What fraction of the adults that produce the kids had brachydactyly? 50%. So nothing's changed in that family. We started with 50% brachydactylous P0s. We ended with 50% brachydactylous F1s. So there's no change. There's no increase in the number of people in the world that have brachydactyly. Because at the same time that cross is happening, what are the other 98% of the adults that are B, little b over little b doing? They're making all these other crosses that produce non brachydactylous kids. So as a whole, despite the fact that brachydactyly is dominant, you just need one copy of big B and you get the short fingers. It doesn't change, it doesn't increase in frequency in the population. We don't get more people and more people and more people in humans developing brachydactyly. So why do you predict that it's dominant, or that it's not dominant, rather? So when I ask in the quiz, here's a picture of a brachydactyl's hand. You say it's a mutant allele that causes it, that's true. Why, is it, why would it likely be recessive? It's not. Can you articulate why you answer that, though? It's something worth thinking about. So it might lead you to some useful insights about genetics. If you, if you figure out why you responded, if you did respond, that this is caused by a recessive mutation. When, uh, when you're doing the cross on the left, you're saying uh, the 50, there's 50-50, but... That's only the possibility. To be able to see that 50-50, you would have to have multiple offspring. That's true. So yeah. So this is the ideal case. If they had four kids, then half would maybe. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. 
maybe. So it's, it's approximate. That's a good point. But then we're also approximating what's happening in all of the 99 or however many, 49, I guess, other crosses that are going on between wild-type parents. So I, on the whole, the frequency of brachydactyly doesn't change. It doesn't go up, doesn't go down, it stays the same in humans from generation to generation. So the thought I'll leave you with, and maybe this is the answer to the question I just posed to you, but again, it's worth, I think, reflecting on this, that when we say that something is dominant, that does not mean that it's predominant. So just because an allele has a dominant effect inside the cell doesn't mean that it's the most common version of that allele. So in the case of brachydactyly, the dominant version is really, really, really rare. 1% of the population or so has it, the big B. So just because something is dominant doesn't mean that it's the most common version of the gene. It just means it acts in a dominant fashion inside the cell whenever it's present in an individual. So next time we start talking about complex traits, one that I think might be useful to talk about, which we will, is polygenic traits. So when multiple genes control a single phenotype like skin color, and this is a really useful case study to think about. So I'd like not only to read the couple sections in the chapter, but also take a look at this story that was written about the ever-increasing number of cases of twins that have different skin color. Like, so here are two pairs of twins from the same parents, so unlikely as it is, the same parents have two sets of identical twins, except they're not so identical in skin color, or eye color for that matter. And so we'll start talking about these sorts of effects next class. Any final questions? All right. Have fantastic weekends. Go to the game if you can.